What's the word, y'all? One thing I can say is true about the Joel Embiid era with the 76ers is that ownership and management have always tried to put Joel Embiid in the best position to win a championship. And I know that doesn't say much, but I see other stars across basketball and, and sometimes they don't have a front office that is completely, completely bought into their timeline. Well, Joel Embiid has always had his management on his side, right? Sometimes they make the wrong decision. Uh, Tobias Harris over me, like that Jimmy Butler clip, they obviously made the wrong decision, but they always have had his best interest and Philadelphia's best interest in championship and mine. And obviously, they put together some really cool teams, some really good teams. But this one right now, this 2024, 2025 team, at least on paper, is my favorite. And Lord knows I did enjoy watching Jimmy Butler with the team. I enjoyed watching Prime Ben Simmons. I enjoyed watching the dribble handoff between JJ Redick and JoJo. But this one right here, I think, at least on paper, fits Joel Embiid better than any of those other teams. And you could argue, talent for talent. This team, actually, that's a good conversation. I, I was going to say this team is better than any Joel Embiid team. But again, we're just talking talent, not necessarily fit. Uh, ben Simmons, all defensive teams. Jimmy Butler, even though it was only a season and a half. It's, it's, it's a real conversation. It's a real conversation. I think that team might have been more talented. But when you talk about fit and everything like that, this team right here. I think they got to be. So here's the projected starter lineup. You have Maxi, Oubre, George, Martin, and Joel Embiid. Off the bench, it's not the most deep team in basketball, but I do see some good things here with Kyle Lowry, Eric Gordon, Ricky Council is finally going to get an opportunity to play real minutes. I've liked the small amount, amount I've watched of Ricky Council, but when you're only playing nine minutes per game, again, DMPs a lot of these games, it's hard for me to have a real opinion about him as a hooper. Uh, you got Kmart Jr. You got Drummond back to steal all the rebounds. And then these last four dudes, I think they're going to have an opportunity to play, but with Jared and and, and and Bona being rookies, I just don't know how much they will. Reggie Jackson is going to play some regular season. And, and as far as role players go, Gershon Yabusele is one of the biggest wild cards in all of basketball because if he can translate that near 40% three-point shot that he did overseas over the last four seasons to the NBA, he's going to steal minutes away from a Kmar Jr. or even a Caleb Martin. That's if the jump shot is true. And a couple days ago, we made a video um, about the Boston Celtics, and we talked about how head and shoulders, I still believe they have the best roster in basketball. I think they're well coached and so on and so forth. But going back to back in this current era of basketball is just extremely difficult. So I've been trying to figure out what team I believe is going to be my NBA Finals winner prediction, right? And I'm not saying it's Philadelphia right now, but this has been a team that keeps going around in my head. It's like I, I got like the devil and the angel on my shoulders. Ken Kenny, Joel Embiid is never healthy. Well, if he finally is healthy, then who knows? Like that's what's happening in my head. So I'm gonna talk about all of that. So let's start off. Let's start off here. This this is this is where the devil is on the show to telling me not to believe in the 76ers. The main thing is that Joel Embiid has not been healthy. Simply put, Joel Embiid is one of the most dominant players in basketball, but he has never been able to translate that to the postseason. And two years ago, it wasn't just about health. When you saw him average, let's say, 29 points per game in the regular season, then we get to the postseason, he's averaging 22. A huge, huge drop-off. Over the last couple years, or the last season at least, that has not been the case. He's been able to translate, at least statistically, those numbers over. Pretty cool, right? But the real thing is that he has not ever, ever, ever been healthy. And some of that is by his own doing. Some of that is freak accidents. Some of that is crazy bad luck. I ate something the night before. Now I have the bubble guts in the runs during a playoff series. That's crazy. I have, um, what is it? Something palsy? What was it with his eye? When he was blinking with one eye because it bails palsy? That's crazy bad luck. But part of me is like, Hell, he just is the most unfortunate star of all time. And because of that, it's kind of like a, I got to see it to believe in mindset with part of my brain. I want to see Joel Embiid play multiple series in a row and be healthy before I believe in a team led by him. But counter that, this, the angel is like, the averages say that he can't be, he can't be fighting injury every single postseason, right? And if you watch their media day, he came to the podium and he was asked about it. Like, this was very interesting to me that he didn't, if I was somebody like Joel Embiid and I was the one that lost 25 to 30 pounds, I would have, I would have got that back into the conversation. I would have been the one to bring it up. But it was the reporter at like saying, Jojo, you look kind of slim. He said, yeah, I've dropped 25 to 30 pounds. And I'm trying to go, I'm trying to drop more. So in my mind, I think some of the injuries that Joel Embiid has endured in his career, again, unluckiness like the Bell's palsy or the bubble guts, but part of it, in my mind, I thought he carried a little bit too much weight. And if you're telling me that he's 25 to 30 pounds lighter, the angel, we talking. We really are. He also said in the same breath that he doesn't give a damn about any regular season accolades. Like previous years of his career, he tried to go for an MVP. He got one. 
And last year, if he didn't get healthy 39 games of the season, he would have got two because that's how dominant he was. It seems as though that is not in his mind whatsoever, that he has shifted his mindset to being ready for the postseason no matter what. And I think that part of that mindset shift, and, and one of the reasons why the angel on my shoulder might be defeating the, the can, I, can I stop talking about it like that? Okay, one of the reasons why I'm a little bit more confident in Philly this year versus any other year is I can't stress how important, at least in my mind, that time in the Olympics really is. To be playing alongside the bronze, the Currys, the KDs, the, the, the books, all of these dudes, to be able to go into that setting and take home gold and have him be one of the top performers in a huge comeback versus Serbia, I think all of that things, playing that high leverage basketball is going to improve him so much more. I mean, it's not it's not a coincidence. We've seen this happen before, maybe not to this scale because Jordan Levine is one of the what? five best players in the world, but that Olympics teaches so much. And a lot of the times it's like teaching the young dudes. It's Anthony Edwards being taught by Kevin Durant. It's um, Derrick Rose going out there at the Olympics and then coming back better than ever. Like usually it's the younger dudes, but Joel Embiid has never been able to experience some of this because he hasn't been able to play with some of the best players in the world other than playing in the All-Star game. Right, you gotta think about it like this. A lot of these dudes, and maybe Joel Embiid is on this list too, but I'm just gonna say he's not. You know, he didn't. A lot of these dudes go to the Team USA 16U, 17U, 18U, and they get an opportunity to play with the best in the world. Joel Embiid came over here and they were like, Ben Simmons, this is your teammate. Uh, uh, Robert Covington, come back. You're, you're the team. He hasn't had an opportunity to play at this top end talent for this long, and I do believe that that might help with a mindset shift um, better than ever. And I do believe that Joel Embiid has given us his fair share of stakers in the playoffs. He has. I remember um, before the last postseason run, or maybe that was two postseasons ago, there was a statistic about he is he had the biggest regular season to postseason statistical drop off. Where let's say in the regular season he averaged 28 points per game, and then he got to the postseason he was averaging 21. Those are made up numbers, but something along those lines. And obviously, that's impossible. The question is. Could he have that translate, that dominance that he had in the regular season, could he ever have that translate to the postseason? And while it is, uh, it was very far from a perfect run, hell, they lost in the first round, he, he did play his best postseason series of, I don't know, I don't want to say high importance, right? Because he has had good playoff series, but usually it's him being a two seed going against a seven, him being a three seed going against a six or something along those lines where that first round matchup in a lot of cases is a layup. So you'll have a good series there. But once you start playing against those really good teams, in this case, the New York Knicks, he had struggled. And I thought last year he put together a pretty solid six games in the playoffs, though there were times where it felt like, of course, he deferred to Tyrese Maxey when it got came down to stretch, whether it be because he didn't have his legs or didn't have his lungs, so on and so forth. I thought for the grand scheme of things, it was a really solid playoff run six games can't even call it a run pretty solid six game playoff window for Joel and B and listen it was almost not that right it was game was it game five where Tyrese Maxey became Superman and hit that shot and and one like they almost lost their game and that would have been the series 4-1 and then we have a different conversation because in the close our game you did see Joel and B go out there and give you 39 again even if the fourth quarter I think he gave you like four or whatever but um for the most part, it seems as though he's trending upward. Now, it feels weird to talk about him as if he's a 20-year-old player when he's goddamn 30 years old, but sometimes you do have to take these steps. And I do believe, for the most part, the Joel Embiid playoff conversation is pretty overblown. Like, yes, statistically, you, will, you have seen that drop off historically, but you know what else drops off? His team when he is not on the court. I'm going to see if I can find these statistics. I heard um, Zach Lowe... I heard Zach Lowe talk about this quite a bit over the last couple seasons. Let me see if I can find it. While I can't bring you the clip, I do have the numbers. Where uh, last year, in that one series, six-game series against uh, the New York Knicks, when Joel Embiid was on the floor, they were a plus 46. When he was off the floor, they were a minus 47. That is huge. We can go back to 2019 versus the Raptors. This is the shot that Kawhi Leonard hit. And he had a really bad playoff series, if you think statistically. But when he was on the court, his team was plus 90. And when he was off the court, they were a minus 109. And then in 2021 versus the Hawks, when Ben Simmons passed the ball to, to Matisse Steibel, he was a plus 51 and a minus 31. So, so or well, the minus 31 when he was off the court. So every single year, regardless of whether or not he's individually performing up to his standards, the team is dramatically better with him on the court and just 
let's just say awful. I was going to use an extra word in there. Let's just say awful, awful, awful when he was off the court. And that was one, this is one of the reasons why I like this team a little bit more than some of those others, because I do believe that with the addition of Paul George and having Tyrese Maxey continue to be better and better and better every time we see him, some of those minutes when he's off the court, listen, I don't expect them to even hold their own when he is not on the court. But being minus 109 in a seven game series, and it wasn't like Joel Embiid didn't play normal, like, that is unheard of. So having PG and having Maxi and eventually whoever they trade for with them two first round picks later down the season will just ho hopefully nullify some of that negative impact when Joel Embiid is not on the floor. Because even in that series where um, against the Knicks, where in the fourth quarter, as we mentioned before, he was deferring to Tyrus Maxi, was super slow um, and everything. They guarded him as if he was prime Joel Embiid, as if he had 99 points. And just him having that level of gravity when he is, even if he's not performing himself, it allows others to perform. And that opens the door up for Tyrese Maxey to be amazing. For Paul George to fit comfortably as a third option versus a second option, which he's tried multiple times in his career. But I do believe the window, actually, I'm going to leave that up to y'all. What do y'all think the window of this team is? Because part of me wants to say they have to win it either this year or next year. Maybe this is a buffer year where they try to incorporate all of these new dudes. And when I say buffer year, that don't mean not make the playoffs or not make it out of the first round, brother. You got you to get deep into the playoffs, even in his first year. But maybe this is a, um, a year of learning each other's tendencies and stuff. And the next year is the year that you're really winning it. But after that, if we get three years down the line, Joel Embiid is 33 years old, Paul George is 99 and so on and so forth. I think the window might have shut by then. So they are under an extreme amount of pressure. With that said, I still think to myself, this team can do it. Not my official pick or anything, but I, I think I'm siding closer with the angel on the shoulder versus the devil.